Well, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. This is a special Sunday. We have uh, some guests with us that are not typically with us that used to go to church here but got smart and went somewhere else. <laughs> I'd, I'd like us to pray. Let's just ask the Lord's blessing on today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace that is displayed in our lives because of what your Son has done for us. Thank you, Lord, that regardless of our shortcomings, our sins, and where we fall short, that you stick with us because your love is not dependent upon our perfection. And so, Lord, we stand before you humbly in need of you to speak to our hearts and to encourage us. Pray that you would be with my brother Dave as he comes, that his words would be from you, that his heart would be from you, and, Lord, that we might receive it as it truly is, the word of God. So, Lord, we present ourselves before you as your instruments and your people and the sheep of your pasture and pray that you would encourage and strengthen us this morning through your servant, Dave Hawkins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dave Hawkins. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. The only thing bad about being a guest speaker is that I never get to hear your pastor. <laughs> uh, we are delighted. I'm delighted to be with you. My wife actually traveled with me, but she is not doing well this morning. She is uh, still in the hotel room, just kind of resting, and she says to tell you that she's sorry. Um, with, by God's grace, maybe she'll be here this evening. So let's, we pray so. I am always glad to be back here. There is something about this fellowship that's like coming home. We give God thanks for all of you. Um, we know a few of you. A lot of you are new faces, and that's a good thing. We thank the Lord constantly that the light of Christ continues to emanate from this place where God has put you. And as I asked the Lord what to share this morning with you on this 25th anniversary of Grace Bible Fellowship, I wanted it to be something that would encourage you for the rest of your days. Now, all of us are headed toward that divine appointment. We're either going to exit, we're going to exit this world one way or the other, either with an appointment with the undertaker or when Christ comes in the air. I, for one, believe his coming is soon. Amen. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, because I want your hearts to be encouraged, as mine has been in this study. So go ahead and find 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I have a few more introductory words to say, so I'll give you a few moments to find it. The longer I live on this planet, the more I see how this world system, and the world system is where God has put us as his people. It's where we are to shine as lights. But this system is under the influence of the evil one. Can I, can I get a witness? And, it, and he is the father of lies. Lies abound, they are ubiquitous. <laughs> Philosophical lies, political lies, gender deception, even lies concerning who God is and how to know him. Perhaps most shocking of all, it, our lives, let me put it this way, well-known, highly visible pastors whose lives suddenly turn away from the truth they were preaching and they become uh, people who actually denounce the way of truth. We've heard about some of these in recent years. Scripture warns us that this has warned us that this was coming. Paul said in 1 Timothy, in the last days, many would depart from the faith. Giving, listen to this, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, those come in all kinds of flavors. 
and they're all around us. It's not surprising that scripture is true, is it? But what is surprising to me is that I'm living to see some of these things come to pass. I don't know when the Lord's coming. I haven't written the book, putting a date down. (laughs) As soon as somebody does that, you know they're a false prophet. But what I do know is that we are closer to the coming of the Lord than any other generation. Amen? Amen. And so it is on this occasion, this 25th anniversary, that I want to encourage our hearts from the Word of God. And if you are able to stand in respect for the Word of God, I would like you to do that now, please. If you're not, it's totally fine. But chapter 4, verse 13, through chapter 5, verse 11, it's all one thought. And Paul's words, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, are these. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, let us, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And the second time, Brother Paul says, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Father, we ask you to give guidance as I teach your word. And to all of us, Father, may our hearts be good ground, that the seed of your word would find to germinate and bear fruit. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, like I said, Paul said twice to comfort each other with these words. What does he mean by this? Well, let's go over with a fine tooth comb this comforting reality that he's given us. Because if we are to comfort each other, <laughs> let's understand perfectly what the comfort actually is. Well, first of all, verse 13 tells that, that there is a comfort of what we know. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. God hasn't revealed everything to us. Sometimes I, when I was younger, I used to think I, I wish God had told us more. Now that I'm a little older and got a little gray, I'm happy with what I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes, and I never go looking for information about people anymore. Enough of it just comes to me automatically. <laughs> I'm happy with what God has shown me and what he keeps from me. But here, beloved, he, is, he wants us to know. He says, I want you to know, brothers, concerning those, and this, this is the issue for this original audience, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Now, they needed to know, there, there were some in the first century who everyone has always, first of all, everyone's always been looking for Christ's return imminently, ever since he said he was coming back, and ever since the first apostles saw him uh, ascend. But some of these people, 
expecting Christ to come back, already had friends and relatives who had died. And so without a full revelation from God at that time, they were concerned about the future of these deceased saints. And so God, who's always tenderhearted toward people, he wants them to understand that those who have already fallen asleep, and that's a, that's a euphemism for death here in this context, they're going to be okay. God wants you to know about them. The second thing is, that's comforting is the comfort of God's power. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, catch the next two words, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. I want you to notice the even so. Because these two words connect the resurrection of Christ with the coming of Christ. And the connection is the power of God. In the same way that God was in full control. Listen, the, I don't know what you think about the death and resurrection of Christ, but I'm here to tell you that it was not an accident of history. It was not happenstance. He wasn't overcome and killed. Jesus said, I lay down my life of my own accord. Yeah, the circumstances were kind of nasty, but he laid his life down for us, and he says, I have authority to take it up again. Amen. Amen. So, in the, so Paul is connecting these two. In the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that we will see when he comes to raise from the dead those who have already fallen asleep. Now, I have lots of friends and relatives that are already with the Lord. This is comforting to me. Is it comforting to you? Yeah. So, and contrary to the way things appear, now if you just look at the world, you, you just conclude things are out of control. And we are headed toward a crash. Well, it's, God's never out of control. Beloved, God has never left the throne room of heaven. No matter what's happening, God is moving this world toward his sovereign and predetermined end. And when he does bring things to a close... All those who are his, no matter what's happened to them, no matter what part of history they've played, they're going to be safe in his arms, especially those who have preceded us. And I should have shown you that already. <laughs> the comfort of God's trustworthiness. Now, in 15, Paul says this, for this we say to you, what are the next words? By the word of the Lord. By the word of the Lord. Paul appeals to the very nature of God as he's revealed in the authoritative scriptures. This, Paul says, is a word from God himself. And what God reveals in his word is how trustworthy? Totally. Absolutely trustworthy. Thank you. Because he is absolutely trustworthy. There is a comfort in the certainty. Let me go back a second. The certainty with which Paul speaks. Notice, and I want you to help me out here. I want you, can you see this from where you are? Amen. All right, when we get, when I read and I get to the bold part, you read the bold part out with me, okay? All right, four, now this is, this is the certainty. Notice the terms that Paul uses here under the Spirit's inspiration because he wants you to know with conviction that these things are true. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Do you see any uncertainty there? <laughs> well, neither do I. Uh, Paul's words remove all doubting, all speculation. What God has revealed is what is going to happen. Amen. Amen. There's also the comfort of unmistakability. 
Well, a little uncoordinated here, but we'll get it. Unmistakable. Now, this is going to, you're, you're just going to love this. I'm telling you. Put your seatbelt on. Verse 16, the Lord himself will descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. You have to understand what Paul has done here. Under the Spirit's leading, he has reached into the military world and grabbed a, a, a term for a commander giving an order. Now, let your mind go back to the first century. And when an army was invading and, and you know, they had lots of infantry, the, 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 the soldiers would cover the, the whole landscape. Well, you can't hear a commander's order if you're way over there and the commander's way over here. So what would happen? The commander gives the order. The, the, the um, subordinate commanders would repeat the order. Over until everyone heard it, and then the trumpet would sound to advance. This is the imagery Paul has created by using these terms. Christ, some somebody, there's the, maybe the command, the commander himself will give the order, the shout. The archangel will repeat the shout. Somebody, one of those guys up there is going to blow a trumpet, and we're out of here. We're out of here. Amen. The point is, it's unmistakable. Nobody's going to miss it. He's coming. Amen. And finally, the comfort of God's promise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, where will we be? We will always be with the Lord. Verse 18 tells us to comfort one another with these words. This is the point of action for us, beloved. This is what we do with the passage. Remind each other. You know, some people get discouraged living in this world. Some people become a little disillusioned. Some people forget how amazing God's grace really is. We need to encourage each other. And so while we understand that these are precious promises to us and that we need to remain focused until the coming of our king, remember, the coming of the Lord is comforting to us, but it is anything but comforting to those who are without Christ. Because he goes on to say in chapter 5, he goes on to tell us about the coming calamity. The Holy Spirit has inspired some word pictures. Again, this passage is full of word pictures that will speak volumes to us. He speaks of a thief in the night, and this is an unexpected catastrophe. An unexpected catastrophe. In the day that the Lord comes, the world will be as unready for Christ as normal home dwellers when a thief breaks in. No one's expecting to get robbed. You see, what, the, here's the picture. You're, there's an illusion of safety. Unaware of imminent danger. Helpless and without defense. He's coming as a thief in the night. His coming is not unexpected because people have not been warned. It's unexpected because the warnings have not been heeded. There's also going to be devastating destruction. For when they say, verse 3, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. I don't think destruction needs to be unpacked, do you? Destruction is destruction, and it'll be sudden. It'll be devastating. Thirdly, it's inescapable. The, the analogy of a woman heading into labor. You know, God bless you women for bearing children. I'm telling you, if, if the human race was up to us guys, it would have died out a long time ago. <laughs> you know that labor is coming and labor's going to be tough. That's why it's called labor. <laughs> and you can't escape it. 
So it is in the day when unbelievers face the full brunt of God's wrath. They will stand before the wrath of God unprepared, unprotected, and unable to escape. These are very sobering words. What do we do with them? Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> I, think, I think Paul wants us to ask that question, don't you? The next verse, verse 4, look at that. But you. These are, these, are, these are holy words. But you. There's a distinction here between what's going to happen in the world and the people of God who are still living in the world that's going to face God's wrath. We have, we have a calling, beloved. Listen, more images for you. But you, beloved, live as light. Hold on. There we go. This is our call to faithfulness. Live as light. He gives us the imagery of light. You are, Four and five. You are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Paul is reminding us that we have been brought into Christ. And he who is the light of the world resides in us. So what does it mean to be light? Well, first and foremost, it means we have Christ. Amen. It means we can see the seasons of earth to some degree. We don't know everything, but you have a sense that things are becoming ripe for the coming of the Lord. I have to tell you this story. I, was, I had an early morning appointment with somebody and they forgot. So it's like six o'clock in the morning and I was... Long, a long drive from where I was meeting this person. So here I am at six in the morning. So I thought, okay, well, we need a few things. I'll just drop by Walmart. Mm -hmm. So I did. And I wasn't really, it was six o'clock in the morning. Okay. I wasn't really wanting to chit chat with people, <laughs> <laughs> but I get to the checkout and there's this tiny little woman there and she's all chatty. And I'm like, and I'm trying to be courteous. You know, we in the South, we don't, we don't cut people off. We just kind of listen and smile and try to partake. But I hadn't been caffeinated enough. But <clears throat> and I guess she kind of picked up on that. And she looked up at me and she said, the Lord is coming, you know. <laughs> we, I'm telling you, we weren't talking about the Lord. <laughs> I have no idea who she was or why she said that. But I just, it, it grabbed me by the lapels. And I said, I do know that. <laughs> So apparently she could see something about our world that was cluing her that the Lord's coming was soon. And she kind of wanted this grumpy guy behind her in line to know about it. Well, we have, we're light because we have the word of God, beloved. We have this book to guide us. From the very beginning, we wanted to be a church that gave the pure, unadulterated word of God. It blesses me to know that, that that continues under your pastor. But this word prepares us for the day of the Lord. And it, it is to warn those around us who are still in darkness. You know, the command is to go into all the world. You can't physically do that, can you? You, you yourself cannot go to all the world. But how, listen, can you trust God to bring to you the world he wants you to influence? Yeah, because he's the orchestrator of the harvest. And so every one of us who belong to him have a world of our own that he intends for us to influence. And that's where we are the light. He also says to remain awake. Now he uses, I get so ahead of myself here. He uses um, sleep here differently than he did in chapter four. Okay, it's got a, so, so don't think it's the same. Sleep in chapter 4 is speaking of death. Sleep here is speaking of being unconscious and disengaged in what God is doing. Notice what he says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. The watch and be sober is contrasted to sleeping, so that's where you get your definition. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So what does it mean to be asleep, beloved? There are a lot of sleepy people in church. I'm not, and I'm not trying to be funny. I, I mean, theologically sleepy. Amen. It means to be unconscious of the world's digression. 
You okay with sin all around you and maybe in you? You shouldn't be. In fact, you should be worried if you're okay about that. To, to be asleep means to be disengaged from God's purposes. We talked about that a moment ago. God's purposes are to use us in our individual context to bring the light to people. To be asleep means that you yourself have become dull and unable to act and obey Christ because of all the stuff that you've allowed in your life that Jesus ana analogized like weeds growing up in your garden. He says also, therefore be watchful and awake. Be watchful and sober. Verse 6, but let us watch and be sober. These two things go together. You can't, you don't want uh, somebody on guard duty who's drunk. <laughs> no, you want somebody sober who's looking for the enemy. So what are we watching for? The sudden appearing of the Lord. Amen. 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 We are, and we have all kinds of indications given here, given in scripture concerning the coming of the Lord. Uh, he is withholding the, the, the detail of the actual timing I had a, had a professor years ago who theorized that when you think, why did God not give us some more specifics about this? And he theorized it because Satan knows scripture and he doesn't want the enemy to know. You don't tell the enemy your plans. <laughs> That's an interesting theory. But we also watch out. Listen, we watch out for that tendency inside every one of us to become way too comfortable in this world. To start not being so bothered by sinful things. To find a substitute fulfillment for what only Christ can fulfill. It was C.S. Lewis who said this, The problem with our hearts is not that we want too much, but that we're satisfied with too little. Hmm. We must be cautious concerning these tendencies in order that our minds and our hearts, our behavior would remain focused on how we should be living. Not overcome by outside influences, not distracted by worldly things. We have a calling to live as light, to be awake, to be watchful and sober. Now, God's not just giving us information. This is a calling to a certain kind of conduct, which is why he follows with two more word pictures <laughs> to help us grasp these things. And they are seen in verse eight. There they are. The breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. It's important to understand things because these are what's going to encourage you and help you remain focused. Both of these images communicate intentionality to living and a Christ-like purposeful approach to life. They both communicate that. Let's break them down. The breastplate of faith and love. If you think of a soldier's, uh, in the first century, a soldier's breastplate, it covered his vital organs, right? Now, imagine a cross on it, okay? We're, I'm not, not a crusader. I'm just saying this is going to help you, okay? <laughs> this breastplate of faith and love is both vertical and horizontal. It is faith toward God and love for him first and foremost. Because w when you love God... You love what God loves, and that's people, and that's the horizontal part. Faith is demonstrating, you walking by faith is demonstrating that God is leading your life and that he's bringing you next, he's rubbing your life up next to others who need to hear about Christ, who need your compassion, your help, your touch, any way that they can understand that Christ has given himself for them. You've heard that phrase, you're the only Jesus some people will ever see? It's really true. So your faith and love is first toward God and also toward people. When you get this right, this flows automatically. 
And so just as the breastplate would cover your heart and vital organs, so also does this spiritual breastplate enshroud absolutely everything that makes you you. That's the way it should work. The other image is the helmet. Now, careful. This is not saying get saved. He's already writing to believers. What is he, what's a helmet for? I don't know what the army called it. In the Air Force, we called them our brain buckets, okay? <laughs> but they're to protect. The, the, the helmet goes around your brain. Your brain is a vital organ. It kind of needs to be protected. That's the imagery that Paul wants us to understand. The Holy Spirit wants us to understand. Because this mindset, if you will, of salvation needs to totally encompass your brain. Every day of your life, every activity, every word, every relationship ought to be governed by what is God doing here? The picture is to be fully encompassed by salvation. It is, let me say it this way. It's a call to missional living. I don't know what you do to make money. I don't, well, I do care. Um, but that's not my point this morning. However you make your living, you have a calling above that. I always believed when I was in the military that while, while some trained chimpanzee in Washington was throwing darts at a, at a, a world map and sending me wherever it was, <laughs> that's the way we said we got orders, um, that God was ultimately doing that. He used the U.S. government, but it was mostly, it was ultimately him. It's a call to missional living. Everything about us needs to be enshrouded in this calling. We proclaim to the lost around us how they can be saved. Because why? What did Peter remind us? It is not God's willing that any should perish. That's right. Any being interpreted, interpreted means any. Look at verse 9 and 10. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. These words remind us that we are the recipients of God's blessings. We have been delivered and are safe in Christ's care. But that is not the case for those who are mentioned in verses 1 through 3. And that ought to grab us by the lapels. They are still facing an eternity of perpetual destruction. Brothers and sisters, salvation is not just our inheritance. It's our mission. Amen. And he says in verse 11, for the second time, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Do you want to be a church that is found faithful when Christ appears? Yes. I believe you do. Then comfort each other with this. Let's, let's just take to heart all we've just understood. Comfort each other. Remember that as we near the coming of the Lord, our world will get worse and worse. In another little more than a week, your candidate may not win. You know, I read in the Old Testament and the New that God places authority figures over nations. That's a really hard pill to swallow sometimes. <laughs> But it's still true, isn't it? We ought to do our duty, our due process as Americans. What a wonderful privilege we have. But we accept the outcome as God's will. Have you embraced the truths, the word pictures, that which applies to you? Have you embraced that? Do you, do you love, do you have a, a faith and love first and foremost for God? And then as an automatic result, because your heart is right with God, do you love the people that God's placed around you? You know, some people are easier to love than others. That's just a fact of life, isn't it? Who needs comforting? He says comfort one another with these words. Who needs comforting? Well, the discouraged people need comforting, don't they? Yeah. Uh, they, they, need, they need the truth to lift their head back up so they can see Christ more clearly again. They, they need a renewed motivation toward obedience. Those who may be afraid, you know, I, I understand fear. So I, 
in a witnessing opportunity, Andy and I were talking about this last night, uh, uh, in a witnessing opportunity, I'm absolutely brilliant 30 minutes after the encounter. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in the moment, may God help us to forget all of our stuff. And remember, there's a lost soul that's going to face eternity without Christ. And, and do you think God can handle our flaws as he uses us? I think he's kind of used to handling flawed people. It's kind of like the only kind he's ever had. <laughs> he also says, edify one another. Well, these truths are meant to be that with which you build up one another. That's what edify means. You strengthen each other. You hold on. Uh, within the body of Christ, there are obedient people. There's also sometimes some disobedient people. Sometimes I mean, you and I may be one of those disobedient people in a certain area. We need other people to come alongside us and help us. Because we may not be walking according to God's commandments. We need a word of truth from another believer. Sometimes life gets distracting. You know, if you've got a lot of crises that come in all of a sudden or, or hardship, it gets, it gets distracting. Sometimes we distract ourselves by looking at things we shouldn't look at, by, by grasping for things that are of no eternal value. <coughs> Sometimes believers become disengaged because they're so, so withdrawn because of stuff they've allowed in their lives that they've actually forgotten about their privileged duty to be representatives of Christ. Amen. And then there are some who are disillusioned. The struggle against the flesh and the world has just become so hard for them, they don't even know what to do anymore. They need you. We need each other. They lost their perspective on why they're here, and they've forgotten about how lovely and how beautiful the grace of God really is. <coughs> Remind them. Build them up. Admonish them. Christ is coming. Do you believe that? Yes. His coming will be glorious and unmistakable. He will transform us into his likeness. One second into eternity, you won't have this sin nature anymore. Can I get a witness? <laughs> That's our hope. It's our comfort. But the text also reminds us that there are those who will be left in the day of the Lord, who will be surprised by his coming, who will be devastated by the destruction and destroyed in their lostness forever. We are to be light. We are to be awake. We're to be watchful and sober. Um, my own mother, who rejected the Lord all her life and was uh, just overcome by her own sinfulness, an alcoholic, uh, the list could go on and on. Vicki and I prayed for her for years. It was only in when she was about 10 days from death. Of course, we didn't know that death was 10 days away, but it was only then that I visited her in her hospital room after praying much that God would give her an opportunity to receive Christ before she went into eternity. And as I walked into her room, I kind of saw her staring into space. I said, Mom, what are you thinking about? And she said, forever is a long time. I knew God had gone before me. I knew this was the moment. And so once again... The gospel that she had always pushed away, she was now ready to receive. She came into the Lord that day, and 10 days later, she was with the Lord. Uh, God changed my life with that experience. <laughs> I, uh, I hadn't always been faithful to pray for her. I'm just, this is a moment of confession, okay? I hadn't always been faithful to believe God would bring her to Christ. But you know what God did? He worked not according to my faithfulness, but according to his. I heard a story, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. A few years ago, I don't know if you know the, the illusion team, Penn and Teller. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Penn Gilliatt is the, the one I'm going to tell you about. He is a self-proclaimed atheist. This is a, their illusions are amazing. But uh, after one of their performances, this man came up to him, this believing man, and he said, Mr. Gilliatt, I know that you're an atheist. 
And he pulled out a Gideon Bible. And he said, but I'd like to give you this Bible if you would accept it. Well, Penn accepted the Bible. And then later he went to his blog and he wrote these words. He, he wrote about, he said, I, I respect someone who will proselytize because of what they believe. If you don't proselytize, you don't believe what you say. And then he said these words. How much must you hate someone to believe that eternal life is possible and not tell them? Those words from an atheist, beloved. We let those sink into your heart. How much must you hate someone to believe that Jesus, that everlasting life is possible and not tell them? So let me ask you this morning, what kind of person are you? Are you a person who longs to see Christ in person? Have you embraced God's agenda? Have, do you have this first and foremost love and faith in God that filters out in a faith and love for people? Trust in God that God's doing a work through you. Yeah, you're a flawed vessel. Join the club. <laughs> Put on the breastplate of faith and love. Trust God to help you learn. Remember we talked about being brilliant after the fact? Well, learn from those mistakes. Learn. Ryan Walter is a dear friend of mine. He was part of the original deacons here. And uh, we were neighbors in Eatontown. And I'll never forget what Brian said to me one day. We were talking about the need to reach our neighbors for Christ. And I said, man, you, you just talk to everybody. I, you, you just, you outshine all of us. And, and I don't mean to embarrass you, brother, but what you said stuck with me. Brian said, I can't not tell them. Amen. I can't not tell them. Amen. Wow. Put on the breastplate of faith and love. Put on the helmet of salvation. Do you live your life believing that God's using you? That God is spreading the message through you? Listen, the gospel, Paul said in Romans 1, the gospel itself, it's not your ability to convince people. The gospel message brings life. The power is in the message. All you got to do is tell the story that Jesus gave himself as a substitute for the sin of mankind and offer them eternal life. Amen. Maybe you're in this room this morning and you see yourself as somebody who might not be saved. Would you bow with me for a second? I want you to think about that as we close. Maybe you haven't taken refuge in Christ. And if Christ came today, and he could, you would face the destruction and the wrath of God. This is your moment to cry out to him, believing that Jesus' death on the cross paid for your sin. What that means is that God's wrath against you was satisfied because he poured out his wrath on his son. Eternal life is now your offering. Will you receive it? Will you receive it from his hand? Tell him now, right where you are. We don't need a big show of moving around. We just need you to do business with God right where you are. Oh, Lord, thank you for the truths that are so rich to our hearts as your children. Thank you that it is not your will that any should perish. Thank you that Jesus gave himself for all of us. We love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be together and to worship your, your worthy name together. And Lord, would you take these things, press them deeply into our hearts and change us so that we are better servants of yours, more intentional toward being Christ-like and purposeful for your agenda in this world. And it is in your holy name, Lord Jesus, that we ask these things. Amen.